turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. That is the uh, first chapter of the entire Bible. And if there is a child in uh, the audience, it is time to be dismissed to Children's Church with your new sign-in lanyards. Compliments to Allison. So good work, Allison. Okay, Genesis chapter 1. See, in my Bible, it's page one. So, <laughs> so there really is so much to cover in Genesis chapter one and chapter two. Just like a good movie that if you miss the first 10 minutes, you've missed everything because so much of the plot is baked into the first few minutes. All of the foreshadowing that's going to take place is going to be dependent on the first 10 minutes. And as you've seen, we preached Revelation 22 last week, and as we discuss, and as I read through chapter 1 and chapter 2, uh, you will see a lot of parallelism. So there's so much in these chapters, there's a lot to say, but the main idea of this sermon is that God creates the world to establish his kingdom on earth. God creates the world to establish his reign and his rule on earth. That's why the kingdom is such a prevalent theme in scripture. Have you noticed that when Jesus comes to earth, what is the first thing he preaches about? The kingdom of God. All of the parables are about the kingdom of God. And if you remember from last week, and I, I hope you do, I preached on it. The new heavens and the new earth are all about God's kingdom. So it's, it's no mistake that Genesis 1 and 2 is also about God's kingdom. Now, God's kingdom is his reign and rule. When God exercises his reign and his rule, it's demonstra demonstrating his power and authority, and that is the kingdom. Now, when creating the world, what God is doing is he's establishing his kingdom on earth. So the main application of this sermon is that, first of all, I would beg, and that is not hyperbole, if you are not a Christian, to trust in Jesus today, because that's how you enter into this kingdom. And if you are a Christian, I would, I would compel you through this preaching, through this sermon, I would beg you also that you would diligently and joyfully work for the spread of that kingdom. So that's my hope today, to communicate to you that Genesis is all about God establishing his kingdom, and I hope that that moves you to trust in God and to spread his glory over the entire earth. So because there's so much to cover, we're just jumping right into it. The first thing we're going to see in Genesis 1 is we're going to learn about the king of the kingdom. So let's read verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first thing we learn from Scripture is that he is eternal. The biblical worldview is not the yin-yang worldview. It's not Star Wars. You see, in these worldviews, you have two eternal beings. You have, you have good and you have evil. And these beings are competing with one another. And the goal, if you know Star Wars, is to bring balance between the good and the evil. Well, that's not the biblical worldview. In the beginning, there was only God. There was only good. The first thing we learn is that the king of this kingdom is eternal. And the second thing we learn from this first verse, there are many things, but we have to be selective, is that this king has power and authority. You know, in order to create something, necessitates that you have some power. You know, I wrote a PhD dissertation that was about 600 pages long. And in order to do that, I had to have mastered certain concepts. I had to master how to biblical interpretation, how to interpret Hebrew, how to interpret Greek, and so on and so on. I had to master these concepts, but also I had to have authority. I had to have a position to be able to write a dissertation. It's the same thing with a car mechanic. Don't trust me to fix your car. I neither have the power nor the authority to fix your car. You take your car to a mechanic, and what do they do? They have the power, hopefully. There's lots of stories about perhaps how that's not true. Uh, but they have the power, hopefully. They, they know how to fix a car. 
if they're working on, you know, an engine, they should know something of engine rods and, and so on, and transmissions, I guess. You, sh you need to know something if you're a mechanic, but also you have to have authority, you have to have a position, right? A, a, a job at a car dealership or, or a car garage to fix a car. Well, it's the same thing with God. What we see in the fact that he is creating is that we see that he has authority and that he has power and he has infinite authority and power because he doesn't merely write a 600-page dissertation. He breathes the universe into existence. So from this first verse, which is so meaty, we learn many things, three of which is that God is eternal. He creates the world by speaking the world into existence. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't battle a, a, you know, a evil to create the world. There's no cosmic battle going on in the creation of the world. There's no balance between powers. There's God who is eternal and who has infinite power and authority. The next thing we learn about the king of this kingdom is that he creates with a purpose. So let's read verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the, earth, of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. These words, form, or without form and void, indicate that the universe was unsuitable for human habitation. Humans could not dwell in the world at the beginning of time. There was no water. There, were no, there was no air. You could not live in this world in the beginning. When God created that very first creation, you could not live there. It was without void and formless. Namely, it was not suitable for our habitation. And yet, when we look at Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, we learn that God is moving creation from unsuitable to a place of fruitfulness and a place of flourishing. It is no mistake that the term fruitfulness is found three to four times in these passages. God, the cadence of this passage is God moving the world from a place of void and formlessness to a place that flourishes. God is moving creation to Eden. And ultimately, we learn that the seventh day is the goal of creation. God is moving this world to rest. And we're going to learn in this passage that rest is a permanent state of flourishing. That's what God does. God creates with the purpose. He moves the world from void, formlessness, to a place of flourishing. And was that not what we saw last week? When we read Revelation 22, and I preached this passage to you, was it not the ideal garden? Was it not an ideal place of flourishing? That is the goal from the very beginning. So that what we saw last week is being uh, sown right here in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. God has a purpose in creation. He moves creation to a permanent place of rest. And then we learn that God exercises his power and his authority for your good. God exercises his power and his authority for the good of creation. Let's read verses uh, 3 through 5. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that it was good. The first time of six occurrences of that statement was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning on the first day. We see the pattern of creation right here in the first day. God simply, he speaks, he sees, and he names. God speaks, he sees, and he names. That is the pattern we see in the six days of creation. And again, we see God's power and authority, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't speak and make something exist. It's impossible. I, with all my might, wish I could have spoken Everton to win a soccer game today. And they lost. I don't have the power to do that. But God speaks and things come into existence. Again, we see God's power and authority. But we also see here that God, when God speaks and he names and he acts, it results in good things. You see, you and I are tempted in many ways to think that God isn't good. We ask questions like, if I'm suffering, how can God be good? 
Or if I have these desires and God says I have to have self-control over them, how can God be good? We ask these questions, but what we see in the six days of creation is the, 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 the drumbeat. The underlining tone is it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. God exercises his power and his authority for your good. That is what God is doing in creation. Now we can, we can march our way all the way down uh, Genesis chapter 1. We're not going to do that. But the main idea we're, we're seeing here is that God is creating the world according to order, according to his power and authority, and for your good. But let's zoom in on Genesis 26 through 28. Because here we transition. We just have learned about the king of the kingdom. Now we're going to learn about the people of the kingdom. And that's you and me. And the main idea we're seeing here is that the people of God's kingdom are co-regents. You were made to reign and rule with God. And is that not what we saw last week in Revelation 22, verse 5? That for eternity, you will live in a place called paradise, reigning and ruling with God. That was God's plan from the beginning. So let's read verses 26 through 28. The word of God says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every creeping thing that moves on the earth. We see that in the six days of creation, there's a pattern. God speaks, God sees, God names. But it's very different when it comes to God creating humanity. God doesn't merely speak. He enters into a dialogue. Notice verse 26. Let us make man. God begins to speak with himself, again demonstrating the utter intimacy of our God. Our God is not a God who just creates the world and is separate from the world. Our God is not just the God who has the power and authority to work the world out for your good, but he doesn't do it because he's aloof and he doesn't really care much about you. No, we see right here the beginning that we are dealing with a king of the kingdom who is intimately involved with his people he enters into a dialogue. Now, we notice uh, in many ways that the creation of man is the crown of creation. It's the crown in many ways. Bless you, Suchi. Uh, we see it because the pattern's broken. God's not merely speaking, but he's dialoguing. We also, if we were to compare the amount of words that Moses use, uses on day six and compare it to the other days, you would notice that he, he's talking a lot more on day six. That's an important principle of interpretation. And when you read the Bible and the Bible uses a lot of words to describe something, it means it's important. And then Genesis 2, we're going to learn, is actually zooming in on the creation of humanity. So the creation of humanity gets the most track time in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. And lastly, we learn that humanity is special. We are made in the image of God. And no other aspect of creation has that identity. So for these reasons, we see that Moses is focusing in on these passages, on this passage, drawing our eyes to verse 26 through 28. So what do we learn about the people of God's kingdom in these verses? The first thing we learn is we learn our identity. That's an important thing to know. Who are you? If you don't know that, you're not going to know how to live in this world. If you don't know who you are, you're going to be utterly confused. You're going to be searching and grappling for anybody to help inform who you are. But the Bible, from the very beginning, tells us our identity. Notice it says in verse 26, God says, let us make man in our image. That's your identity. You are made in the image of God. So what does it mean to be made in the image of God? The first thing it means, it means sonship. It means daughtership. 
means you're in the family of God. Turn to Genesis chapter 5 and look in verse 3. And notice what Moses says here. He says, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, after his own image. And if you go back to chapter 21, what is God doing? He's making man in his own image, in his own likeness. What we see here is that the terms image and likeness mean sonship, daughtership. It means you're in the family of God because Genesis chapter 5 is a genealogy. What does it mean for Seth to be made in or to be born in Adam's image? It means he's his son. When you look at my kid, a lot of people say he looks like me. I don't know. It's kind of hard to tell if your son looks like you. I don't look at myself that often. But he's in my image and he's in my wife's image too. So for you to be made in God's image, it means you're in God's family, first of all. Second of all, it means that you're royalty. Notice uh, verse 28. God says, and it says, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea. And if you look back in verse 26, we we see even more clearly than God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Who has dominion? Kings and queens have dominion. Peasants do not exercise dominion in the ancient world and they don't do it now. For God to say you're made in my image, it means that you're my child and it means that your identity is to function as a king and queen. That's who has dominion. Now, when you look at Romans chapter 5, Paul explains that Adam was a king. And when you look at the ancient Near East, kings say that they are the image of God. What all this means is this. Who are you? What does it mean to be human? It means you're a child of God who is made to reign and rule over this earth. That's what it means to be human. Now, images are valuable because of who they represent. You know, I've already mentioned this, but in 2004, my grandparents' house burned down in the old fire in San Bernardino, and my grandpa had died a few years earlier, and we only had a few pictures of my grandpa. That was before Facebook. It was before a lot of digitized things. It was before iPhone. So we don't have a lot of images. Those images are valuable to me because of who they represent. What does every grandma want for Christmas? Pictures. Why? To show off because they represent their grandkids and they want to show off their grandkids. Images are valuable because of who they represent. If you were to say to me, here's, here's an image of your grandpa, and it would look nothing like him. My grandpa had larger ears than normal and had a receding hairline, and this guy had like super full head of hair and small ears, that wouldn't be valuable to me because it wouldn't represent my grandpa. Images are valuable because of who they represent. Therefore, there are serious implications if you are made in the image of God. The first thing is you should be utter amazed. You should be amazed. Just think about this for a moment. Like, I'm not one for self-esteem talks, but if you want self-esteem, look at this passage. Look at the God we just learned about. He speaks the world into existence. That's our God. He, not, he uses his power not to abuse you. He uses his power for your good. That's why we saw six times. It, it's good, it's good, it's good. God uses his power for our good. That's amazing. That's the most amazing picture ever. And you're made in his image. So first of all, be amazed. Second of all, you better be very, very careful. If you mistreat any other human, you are mistreating the image of God. Imagine if one of you were coming to this picture of my grandpa, I have two, two or three of them, and you were to draw a big mustache on him, and you were just to deface it. That would be an assault to me. If you assault any human, you are assaulting God himself, and God takes that super serious. That's why in Psalm 51, when David says, against you, God, and you, God alone, have I sinned. He has sinned against Uriah, but what does that mean, against you and you, God alone, have I sinned? It's because any sin against any human is a sin against God and God alone, fundamentally. 
period. So if you mistreat any other human, you are assaulting God himself. It would be like going to that grandma and taking one of her grandchildren's pictures and defacing it. That grandma is not going to be happy with you. That's a serious thing. If you objectify another person, anytime you objectify somebody else, you're assaulting God. Anytime you use your power to hurt another person, perhaps with your words, or perhaps with your actions, you're assaulting God himself. Now we could talk, I could talk about this for hours, and there are so many implications. We'll talk about one in particular. God has eternally existed in a relationship with himself. That's called the Trinity. There is one God, and yet there are three persons who are fully God. And when God created hum humans in his image, he created them to look like him. So there is unity in God and diversity in God. There is one God, and yet there are three persons who are fully God. Therefore, we should expect humans to have unity and yet diversity. We should expect all humans to be equal, to have equal dignity before God. We're all made in the image of God. And yet, we should expect diversity. Let's talk about racism for a moment. You know, our world takes this issue very serious, and we should. But the only worldview that can answer it is the biblical worldview. If God only exists as one and he's the same, then what's my rationale for not objectifying other races. There's, there is no rationale. Do what you want because God is the same. But that's not the Bible. God is one and yet he is three. God shares equality and yet there is diversity within God. So any attempt that you or I seek to squash diversity for sameness, we're trying to proclaim to the world that God is the type of God who is the same. And that ain't true. God is one, and God is three. That is the rationale whereby we appreciate diverse races, we maintain equality, because our God, within our Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit share equality and yet diversity. Any attempt to squash diversity for sameness is demonic because it pictures to the world that our God is not diverse. And that is wrong. So there are several implications here. That is just one. Let's not assault humanity, and let's respect, appreciate diversity amongst humanity, because there is diversity amongst our God. So after learning about our identity as made in the image of God, we learn in verse 28 about our mission. What is, what is the mission of humanity? What are we supposed to do? That's a good question to ask. We're supposed to play Nintendo Switch 24 7? Are we supposed to play, you know, watch YouTube videos all the time? Are you supposed to play soccer 24 7, whatever, whatever your passion is? What is your mission in life? Verse 28 says we are to be fruitful, we are to multiply, we are to fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. Five verbs, which basically can be summarized your mission is to spread God's glory over the entire planet. <clears throat> you see, when God's image bearers multiply, when Adam and Eve multiply from the Garden of Eden and they begin to spread and fall out every nook and cranny of the universe, what happens is God's image dominates everywhere. That is our mission. That's your mission. It's to spread God's glory everywhere. You're, it'll be like a priest. What do priests do? They introduce the world to God. That's what you're supposed to do. As you walk, as you talk, as you live, you are supposed to reflect God's image so that the entire universe comes to see, know, and enjoy our God. So what's our identity? You're kings and queens. That has dignity and value. You're sons of the living God. And you have a mission to spread the image of God everywhere. So again, there are many implications here. The first we will talk about is laziness. Laziness has no place in the people of God's kingdom. We're made in God's image. We're made to work, to subdue, 
to exercise dominion. God's not lazy. So when you're lazy, when you don't work, you're really picturing to the world that, hey, God's really lazy. God doesn't work. Don't do that. That's the first application. The second one is when you work and live, it's very tempting to do things for yourself. It's very tempting to go to work so that you can make money, so that you can have a nice, comfortable life. That's selfish. And you're made in God's image to spread God's glory everywhere. Therefore, how should you act? You should act and you should work for the good of creation. That's what God does six times. And it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. Therefore, take your cue from God. When you spread over the planet, spread in such a way that you represent God to the universe for his glory, not being lazy, but working hard for the good of others. So what we've learned so, so far in Genesis chapter 1 is we've learned about the king of the kingdom. He has, he's eternal, and he has all power and authority. And then we've learned about the people of the kingdom. We have lots of dignity, right? We have lots of value. So don't mistreat one another, basically. And now in Genesis chapter 2, well, what, uh, what Moses does is he talks about the seventh day of creation, and then he zooms in on the creation of man. So let's read chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the genealogies of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the days that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. So what we're seeing in uh, verses 1 through 4 is the goal of the kingdom. The goal of God's kingdom is en to enter into this state of permanent rest. Notice something very interesting about the seventh day. There's no evening or morning. Look at the verses. Moses doesn't say, and there was evening and there was morning the seventh day. He doesn't do that. Now, of course, there was, right, a literal evening and morning on the seventh day, but he omits it on purpose. Why? To communicate a theological truth that the goal of creation is to head towards Sabbath rest. Now, we see this in depth in Hebrews chapter 4. I'm not going to turn there and read it, but what we see in Hebrews chapter 4, you could take a note, is that the author of Hebrews says that the seventh day, the Sabbath day, the seventh day of creation, is a picture of something greater. It's a picture of when you come to trust Jesus, you enter into Sabbath rest. And it's also a picture of eternity, the new earth. And when you die, and when you enter into that kingdom, that will be Sabbath rest. So we're seeing that in Genesis chapter 2, what um, Moses does is he omits the evening and the morning in order to indicate that this is the goal of creation. We see the author of Hebrews understands this. And we also see, if you remember, the, goal, the cadence of creation is to move from a place of formlessness and void to a place of fruitfulness. And finally, day 7, a day where that fruitfulness continues forever. So let's recap. The king of the kingdom is eternal, powerful, and has all authority, and who works for your good. The people of the kingdom have dignity because they're made in the image of God, and they have a mission to spread the glory of God everywhere. And the goal of creation is to march toward Sabbath rest. After uh, talking to us about the seven days of creation, Moses then zooms in on the creation of man in Genesis chapter 2. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but who has read the book of Isaiah and been very confused? Or the book of Jeremiah? And why are you confused? There's lots of reasons. One of it is because the Bible loves to repeat itself. I mean, just in the last verses I read, you were probably scratching your head and say, this, it's repeating itself over and over again. The Old Testament loves to repeat itself. And when it repeats itself, what it does is it talks about the same topic, but from a slightly different perspective. That's what Genesis 2 is doing. 
So Genesis 1, the perspective is God's kingdom. And then Genesis chapter 2 is let's focus in on the people of that kingdom. Let's learn a little bit more. You know, it's like uh, we don't use maps anymore because, you know, we have Google Maps. But do you remember uh, those, those old paper maps? Uh, and what, when, uh, right over L.A., there would be a box that would be blown up. And in that box, you would see like the 405 and the 605 and the 110 and so on, right? The purpose of that blown up box was to give you a better perspective on something that was important. That's what Genesis 2 does. It gives you that blown up view on something that's very, very important, namely the people of God's kingdom. So let's read about the people of this kingdom in chapter 2, verse 18, and then we'll skip down to verse 21 through 25. So chapter 2, verse 18 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. In verse 21 through 25, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought it to the man. And the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. What we learn in these verses is again that there is diversity within humanity and there is equality within humanity. We've already talked about that regarding races. Let's now talk to it about gender. In verse 18, God says, I'm going to make a helper suitable for Adam. What does it mean to be woman? It means to be a helper. Now, you might think that sounds derogatory. I don't want to be anybody's helper. Actually, the term helper is a term of honor. Most often, this term is used to describe, guess who? God. God is the helper of his people. And if God's taking this title, do you think it's a derogatory term? Absolutely not. And uh, when God's your helper, guess who's doing all the, the work? So you can connect the dots if you want to for this passage. But Eve is made as Adam's helper. The next thing we notice is is that Adam names her. Notice verse 20. Then man gave uh, chapter 2, let's see, uh, verse 23. She shall be called woman. The ability to name someone means that the person who's doing the naming is the leader and has the authority. That's the same case here. Adam names Eve. So we've seen that Eve is Adam's helper and that Adam names Eve. We see clearly in these passages that there's a difference between Adam and Eve. There's diversity within genders, and yet there is equality in dignity. Notice chapter 1, verse 26, that verse 27, that God created man and woman in the image of God. Man and woman are both made in the image of God. Therefore, Peter in 1 Peter 3 would say that women and wives, you're co-heirs with your husband of the eternal life. Co-heirs. There is equality between men and women. And notice also what... uh, what Adam names Eve in verse 23. He calls her woman. It doesn't take a rocket science to understand that there's a good connection between man and woman, right? Woman, in Hebrew, it's the same word as man. You just have a feminine ending attached to the end. Same word. So when Adam sees Eve, he says, I see equality. There's some similarity going on here. So what these passages tell us is that there's a clear distinction between men and women. You have Eve being a helper, that's her role, and you have Adam naming Eve, and yet you see equality. They're both made in the image of God, and Adam names her the same name. So what we're seeing about the people of God is, again, we have to maintain equality and yet diversity within genders. And listen, I understand how controversial that is. Uh, I understand. I teach at CBU. 
Joe teaches at CBU, we understand how controversial this is. And yet I also understand that the pathway to your joy is this. This is the pathway to your joy. Let's not remember God saying, it is good, it is good, it is good. And then in verse 31, it is very good. This is the pathway to your joy. This is the pathway for our joy. When we embrace with gladness the diversity between gender and yet the equality that we have in God's eye. Now, we could camp here a lot longer, but let's say two things. Why did God do this? Why did God create man and woman, diversity and yet equality? First of all, because it brings a lot of glory to God. This brings glory to God because that's God. Remember, there is diversity in God and yet equality in God. Our God is Trinity. He's not some cosmic nomad who's all by himself. He is Trinity. Therefore, for God to create a world of humans who are made in his image, who share a quality and yet are diverse, brings glory to him because that's God's character. And second of all, why does God do this? Because this brings us the most joy. Remember again, verse 31, God said it is very And now notice notice verse 23. This is the first thing Adam says. And notice what he says. And notice how he says it. I don't know about you, but in my Bible, verse 23 looks different than the rest of the verses. Is that the case in your Bible? That's because this is poetry. When do men break out in poetry? When they're in love. When something amazing happens. Adam sees Eve, his helper, Somebody suitable for him. And he breaks out in poetry. What joy. You know, when you speak poetry, it's because you're happy. It's because you're excited. Adam recognizes Eve as equal in dignity and yet diverse. And he's speaking poetry. Self-explanatory. This is joyous. So we see that in creating gender that are, there's equality and diversity, we see that this is for God's glory because this is God. God shares equality and yet is diverse in the Godhead. And this is for our good. Now, I am not advocating, there are several things I'm not advocating here. Biblical manhood and womanhood is not male privilege where a man gets to use his authority as leader to really serve himself. That is demonic. That's not what God does. God uses his authority for our good. This is not male privilege. If we were to fast forward through the pages of Scripture, we would say that man as the leader of his home is actually commissioned with the task of leading, which means you die for those who you lead. Being a godly leader does not mean you have the privilege to get what you want. It means you have the joy and responsibility to serve those who follow. So I'm not advocating male privilege at all. And I am not advocating, uh, the, the other side of, of this uh, would be, I am, we are not advocating here uh, uh, clearly a view of feminism that says if a woman is to be valuable, she has to do everything like a man. That is evil, guys. That is absolutely evil. Adam and Eve share dignity. They're equal in God's eyes. When you say that if a woman is to be valuable, she has to be able to do anything like a man, what you're saying is what it means to be a woman really isn't that valuable. Really what's valuable is manhood. And that's wrong. Notice something super important. In order for Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, men can't do it alone. Right? And know that women can't do it alone. You can't do it by yourselves. Why did God do this? So he gets the glory. Men, you need women. Women, you need men. And we need to operate according to the confines that God has given to us because this is very, very good. When a husband lays down his life for his wife and when a wife submits to her husband unto the Lord, we see a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ and we see a picture of God because God says to Jesus, go to the earth. And what does Jesus say? He submits. 
The Father and the Son say, Spirit, go to the earth. And they submit. Imagine if Jesus said no. Imagine that you're going to hell. Imagine if the Spirit said no. You're going to hell. This picture of a husband and a wife working together for the sake of God's glory amongst the mission, uh, uh, um, God's mission of spreading his glory amongst the world is so, so good. You get it because you understand the cross is so, so good. That's what we're advocating here. So when we come to the people of God, what we see is that there is equality between all humans, and yet there is diversity. We must be a church that champions the differences, praises the differences. We have to be a church where the men praise the women. And we need to be a church where the women are praising the men. And we need to be a church where the white people are praising the Mexicans and the Mexicans are praising the African Americans and so on and so on. That has to be the church we need to be because when we do that, we're demonstrating that our God is equal. There is unity in the Godhead and yet there is diversity. This is the people of this kingdom and that's the people we need to be. Now Moses focuses on two more things, the place of the kingdom in chapter 2. And we see this in verses 8 through 15. Basically, it's Eden. And Eden is amazing. Uh, we, we think of adjectives like Edenic and things like this. Paradise. Um, Eden is the ideal place where God's dw- glory dwells. That's the place where God's kingdom rules. And that's what we saw last week. When God's reign and rule happens on earth, we get Eden. And then the last thing I want us to focus on is the rule of God's kingdom. And we see this in verse 16 through 17. Let's read verse 16 through 17 in chapter 2. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For on the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This at first seems a bit of a, this seems a strange command. So let's talk about it. Adam and Eve had knowledge before they ate of this fruit. Remember, Satan goes up to Eve and says, what did God tell you? And Eve knows. So the knowledge of good and evil just doesn't mean it's the ability for them to know. When you look at the phrase, knowledge of good and evil, and similar phrases, we learn that to know good and evil is to be able to be your own to be able to be able to declare moral autonomy from God. To eat of this tree was to rebel against God's kingdom, was to say, you know what, God? You are telling me what to do, but I don't think so. I can be morally independent from you. I can be autonomous. I could be my own God. That's what eating from this tree does, and we're going to talk about that a lot next week when it actually happens in Genesis 3. But what we need to know is that the rule of God's kingdom, if you are to be God's people in his kingdom, what is the rule? You submit to his kingship. That's what it is. You submit to him being God. You glorify him as God, and you enjoy being a human. That is the rule of the kingdom. And that is so good because next week we're going to learn that when adam and eve seek to grab for themselves deity what happens death shame hiding from one another and isolation the rule of this kingdom is good remember the refrain it was good and it was good and it was good so what do we see in genesis chapter one through chapter two we see that god is creating the earth in order, to, in order for him to establish his kingdom, we see who this king is. We learn who the people are. What's their mission? We learn about where they live, and we learn about the rule of this kingdom. So the obvious question is, which kingdom are you in? Are you flourishing as a human? Do you want to flourish? Well, the pathway to your flourishing, being very good, is embracing with joy God being God. Are you embracing that? Are you trusting God? Or are you still attempting to be your own God? Doing things your own way, doing whatever you want to do. Whose kingdom are you in? It's easy to tell 
so many ways to tell. But simply asking the question, uh, who is your master? If you're saying Jesus, then you're in the kingdom. And if you're saying me, or you're filling it in with something else, success, prestige, money, drugs, well, then you're not in the kingdom of God. And then I ask you, if you're not in the kingdom, would you come today? Would today be the day that you come to the kingdom of God? You lay down your arms and trust that Jesus is king. And if you are in God's kingdom, then let's live radically for the sake of God's glory. Let's live radically in spreading God's image everywhere because that's our mission. And then Sabbath rest comes. One final point I want us to make is you see God loves foreshadow. What is God doing in Genesis 1 and 2? He's talking about his kingdom. And what's the pathway to him fully establishing his kingdom on earth? The pathway is when an image bearer of God is fruitful and multiplies and fills the earth so that his image is everywhere. Adam was never intended to be that image. But he was a model who pointed beyond himself to a different image bearer of God, who is Jesus, who indeed through his life, his death, his resurrection, him reigning and ruling over the earth perfectly, perfectly reflecting God in his life, in his ministry, and his death, what does he do? He accomplishes the mission. God's image is spreading everywhere. And then Sabbath rest. So brother and sister, let's embrace with joy Jesus who is our king and who is the one who accomplishes this mission because soon, soon we will enter into an eternal Sabbath rest for God's glory. Let's pray. Lord, we read in your word about your kingdom So many things are so challenging to us. So many things are challenging to this world because this world is not your kingdom. There's so many challenges. So I pray for my brothers and sisters as they have heard your word that they would embrace it with joy. That they would understand that the pathway to their joy and happiness is trusting in you. Let them do that today. And I also pray For those who are lost, God, would you do a work of drawing them to yourself now? And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.